Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and of course I've got uh, my main sidekick here, uh, Shackleton, and I've also got Sally here today. Sally's pretty, pretty comfortable here, warming, warming me up, and vice versa. And also, you know, one of the big topics of today is hurricanes. So, you know, of course, Sally has just struck the U.S. Hurricane Sally is a category two very slow moving storm it reminds me a lot of harvey but the main uh, point of this video and probably the next few will be to look at the connections between the jet streams and these uh, hurricanes that we've been getting both in the atlantic basin but also in uh, the uh, south korean peninsula and japan they had three they call them, uh, they don't call them hurricanes, right? They're, they're uh, typhoons or, or uh, tropical storms, or just they call them cyclones, right? They're called different things in different places, but they're all, they're all amounting to the same thing. Very powerful, low pressure area. Uh, so high pressure goes in to that, high pressure air goes into the low pressure area, deflects to the right in the Northern Hemisphere, generates these uh, cyclones, which is the general term for these storms. So, of course, the jet stream is getting wavier and slowing down because the Arctic is warming extremely rapidly. And, uh, you know, it affects, it, it guides storms, but also the storms themselves, when, they be, when they're very, very large, like, like in the case of hurricanes, they can actually distort the jet stream. Energy can be transferred from the actual storm to the jet stream and that can increase the meridional movement, the north-south uh, movement of the jet stream, and then that propagates downstream thousands of miles away even. So what I'll show is that the series of storms that hit Japan and the South Korean Peninsula recently were directly responsible for perturbing the jet stream, leading to a very strong and powerful trough over North America, causing temperatures to go from about 100 degrees Fahrenheit to below freezing in the matter of, uh, you know, a day, day and a half, two days. Okay, so there's lots of interactions and connections, and I'm going to go into the details here, but I'm getting kind of warm, and these guys you know, these guys have been good, but their patience is not infinite. So let's, uh, let's, uh, there we go. Release them. Okay, so let's get right into the, uh, into the uh, data here. I'll just move this up a little bit. Okay, so what this image here is showing, um, you can see... So this is the jet stream here. As these storms come up, okay, tropical cyclone Maysak, Maysak comes up. The jet stream, there's tropical storm Haitian. The jet stream gets given a bit more energy. The ridge becomes more powerful here. The speed of the jet stream becomes more powerful and you can see the ridge and then it transfers down the wave and amplifies the ridge over North America. And the trough then gets amplified here. And uh, we get this huge swing in extreme weather in the uh, US. So I'll go into more detail with this. Let me go to the beginning here. So my last, the last blog was, find out soon how, will, how low will the big Arctic Ocean slushy go? So. This was uh, posted um, about a week ago, not quite. And um, if you haven't seen this uh, post-Doom conversation that I had with Michael Dowd, I highly recommend it. I talk about, you know, we talk sort of about how everything with climate and the coronavirus, et cetera, how, how it's affecting people and how one can deal with it psychologically. So there's, you know, some of the insights, some of the ways that I look at things to um to deal on an emotional level with the 
with the breakdown, seeming breakdown of society, all of the things that are happening in rapid succession right now. So make sure you have a look at that. That's on my the latest blog. And the question is, how low will the big Arctic Ocean slushy go? Okay, so, you know, I did a series of videos on the, you know, basically the Arctic sea ice, how it's the trends, how it's uh, declining rapidly. I also interlaced it with a series on atmospheric rivers causing the, have the potential to cause a mega flood in California. It's just a matter of time and the risk actually is higher than that of a, of a major earthquake. So make sure you have a look at the, my videos and, uh, you know, please consider uh, donating to my PayPal to support my efforts and work. Okay, so the Arctic sea ice here, if you Google Arctic sea ice graphs and load it up, this is all that we have left here. Very, very small amount of sea ice. Um, if you compare it to the 2012 minimum, the, the minimum record, which is the dashed line, where the blue line in 2020, you know, there can still be some dips, but it pretty much looks like we've t uh, tied up uh, second place here. We're under 4 million square kilometers, but we're not likely to reach the, the 2012 level. Okay, uh, so, but this is an interesting plot. This is the uh, Bremen uh, plot, and you can see here, uh, you know, how, how it's above the 2012 minimum. But there's a bit of a story, a backstory behind that. Okay, so on Twitter, I sent out this tweet um, here and I bumped it up. So what am I saying here? Um, the Arctic sea ice extent. Bremen adjusted their graphs for 2020 to match the National Stone Ice Data Center and the, the Japanese uh, plot. Seems very dubious and shady to me. This was September 11th, okay? They say that they found an error in their data. So let's look at what they what they did here. So I put four plots here. Okay, so this plot is the Bremen graph um, updated on September, September 10th. So 2020 is the red line. So you show it's actually neck and neck with the record in 2012. Okay, in fact, it's dipped below it for the particular date, September 10th. Okay, and then um, if I do a close up on this region, you can see here, you know, we've just dipped under the 2012. And then on the September 11th uh, data, they show this is a curve. So what they did is they basically shifted the whole red curve for 2020 up. And they said there was an error. They found an error. And well, what, you know, it seems to me that they, I mean, it seems like, first of all, why would they shift it up, you know, just a few days before the minimum? You know, they say they only noticed the error then. So they shift, anyway, they shifted the whole curve up. And if you do a close up of what they have now, it's it's this, okay? So it matches the the other data, but you know, it's not, I, I'd like to see more details on why they actually did it at this particular time. So if you look at the differences between this curve and this curve, they shifted up, you know, quite a bit. And if you look over here, and compare the, the structure of the red curve over here to what it was in the original curve, the whole, it looks to me like they've shifted the entire red curve up, okay, by, by you can see by how much, by this amount here, this distance here, they've shifted, it looks like the whole red curve has been shifted up, because if you compare it up here, it's overlapping uh, a curve here, and if you go back here, um, it's underneath it, okay? But is that the amount? It, like, I, it looks to me like the entire curve was shifted up. And, uh, you know, that's a little bit uh, sort of... It's, it's an interesting point that they did that. I mean, if you followed this curve, this is supposed to be more detailed, higher resolution data than the National Snow and Ice Data Center and the JAXA data. And uh, but they say they've got an error and they're up higher. So anyway, that's that's where where it stands on that. Now on Facebook, um, I posted the uh, if you go to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, this is on my Facebook site. 
it's open to everybody to look at. Um, I'll try to add you, uh, you know, when I have space, but I'm pushing up to 5,000 there. So I have a Facebook page as well, which has no limit. Um, another page. Anyway, this is the medium ice edge, 1981 to 2010. And this is where we're at uh, this year. And, uh, you know, um, they, they wrote up a, a, an article about it just yesterday. National Snow and Ice Data Center. So you can go there and Google it. So here's the sea ice extent, September 16th, uh, sea ice concentration and the curve here. So this distance, this gap here now matches uh, what the Bremen data is. So it looks like Bremen basically just shifted up their data just to, to be in line with the Snow and Ice Data Center. So again, I say that's a bit sort of, it's, it's, it's a bit... Um, um, I, you know, they find an error, sure, they should, they should make a big deal about it and say exactly, give us details of why they did what they did, because it looks highly suspicious, as I said in my tweet here, which is, but we go close this, so, they adjusted their graph for 2020, seems very dubious and shady to me, why, I mean, let's see the details of this, don't just say it's an error and we adjusted it. But anyway, this is the National Snow and Ice Data Center um, article just yesterday on us being suddenly in second place. So the first week of September, the sea ice extent had a sharp down, downward turn, exceeding the pace of decline for any previous year during that period. So it came into a firm second. Pulses of warm air from north central Siberia are responsible for the late downward trend, but in the last few days it slowed and the minimum is imminent. So here's where we are right again. This is the Arctic sea ice extent for September 15th, 3.74 million square kilometers. And that's down. Um, uh, da, 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 da. 3.74 million square kilometers or 1.44 million square miles. It's well below uh, previous lows of 2007, 2016, and 2019, and it's within 400,000 square kilometers or 0 0.4 million square kilometers of um, the record low set in 2012. Um, okay, uh, so this is the record low in 2012, and this is where we are in 2020, and these are some of the previous low years. Uh, the purple is 2016, the dark green is uh, 2007, and the blue, uh, the blue here, um, can't really tell the colors. I guess the dark green is 2019. I can't really tell the, the difference here. This looks darker than this. Okay, those are previous uh, minimums. But here we are here, significantly lower than the three next closest years. So we're in a strong second place. But again, you know, what happened with the Bremen data, which, which had this line, you know, going right along the 2012 uh, data line. And uh, this is the sea ice concentration. Um, left on September 12th, 2020. Okay, very, very thin ice. This is the sea ice extent. This is comparing September 1st, 2020 to September 14th, 2020. Okay, so the blue is the, is, uh, the, is this year, is uh, the, uh, September 1st, 2020 is in white. Okay, and September 14th, 2020 is in blue. So that shows you where we've lost the ice in, you know, recently. Okay, the most recent losses of ice were in, in those regions. And Arctic temperature is very, very warm on this side of the Arctic, a bit colder over on the Greenland side. And, uh, you know, from those, you can figure out which way the winds blow, etc. This is the sea level pressure. Okay, so you, and this is the uh, motion of the ice. Um, this is five centimeters per second, smaller arrows, and the larger arrows, 10 centimeters per second. And you can see there's still export out the Fram, some export out the Canadian Archipelago, not much, but the, and you can see the, the patterns of the ice movement there. Thanks for listening, I'll continue.